I'm Don Brown. This is Dr. Craig Zimmerle. Uh, we're from kind of up in the Booster area. Uh, he's from Wayne County, I believe, and I'm from Coshocton County. Um, and uh, just just for the official information, this is an FNC 13901. Correct? Yes, and that's a project. And that is a project. Name. So you can look them up. So you can look that up when you go on the web page. Okay. Uh, Basically, I would expect why everybody put, are here is because you're greeting or have a flock of sheep and you're greeting sheep, and that is why we got involved in this process of trying to um, say, you know, the farmer can do this himself. You don't have to have a technician maybe down the road someday to do this, and you can do it yourself. And that's, I was raised in the equine industry, and when I moved to Ohio in 75, the equine industry was just now starting to breed artificially horses and mares, all right? And it's been done for years in the cattle and the hog industry. In the sheep industry, it's been done, but not on a regular basis here in this country. And so what I'm saying in my mind is what we're doing today and starting through this research grant is we're trying to say 20 years from now, I want you to be able to, you be able to, you be able to, to breed your own sheep artificially. And it should be a common thing to do if everything would work out 20 years from now. So this is just the research and trying to say, let's get started, let's see how far we can go with it, and what we can do with it. And the project started with a lady by the name of Kathy Billy Cup in Moose, Ohio, as Katahdin sheep, hair sheep. Uh, I'm not saying that's an official sheep or anything, but that's her breed. And uh, she was trying to get genetics out of Arkansas, but they had foot rot. So you can't bring up a ram from Arkansas. And so that led to the discussion one afternoon, one evening, uh, Dr. Bill Shula uh, from Ohio State and um, Dr. Notter from Virginia Tech were sitting at the table with us. And we decided all of a sudden, maybe this thing could roll around and start working correctly. Uh, so anyways, uh, we got involved and Kathy helped write a grant and stuck my name on it. I appreciate that very much, Kathy. And so um, anyways, we went and, uh, and it's developed a little bit. And we've had some, we've gone through this for a year, and we've had some good parts, bad parts, and we're just trying to inform you of what we've done and where we're going with it. So, Greg, it's up to you. Okay. Can everybody hear me? You have to have it on. Use it? It's okay. for the recording. Okay. So, as Don, Don talked about, you know, the reason for doing this um, trial and everything, so we'll just get started here and kind of go through and um, talk a little bit about the highlights of, of what we did um, for, for the whole trial and everything. So <clears throat> why, why would you want to artificially inseminate sheep? There's um, four main topics or, or areas that come to, come to my mind. One is we can make faster genetic improvement. So if we um, are using our own flock of, of sheep for, for improvement, we use a new ram each year that, that we produce, we're kind of limited on the traits that we can select for. And, and also, we're, we're limited in not being able to use the best rams that, that are available. So with, with artificial insemination, we can, we can accomplish that. Like Don spoke about um, biosecurity purposes. You know, if, if you um, find a great ram that, that meets your, your uh, specific traits that you're looking for, but comes from a flock that has uh, uh, OPP, foot rot, you, you name it. I'm going to be a little bit hesitant to bring that uh, ram up to, to use. So with um, artificial insemination, biosecurity is still a concern, but it's it's much of a, a of a less than a uh, concern. The cost of purchasing a quality ram every few years. Um, I'm involved with the club lamb industry, and you can spend ten to twenty thousand thousand dollars. For, for one ram. So I mean, it gets pretty cost prohibitive, but in order to keep up with, with the Joneses, so to speak, you almost have to do that or suffer and pay the consequences at not being at, a, at as a high of a genetic level as what everybody else is. And you'll have a harder time selling your lambs, getting, uh, getting interest in your, in your breeding stock then. And the last comment that I have to say about, about why the artificial inseminate is some of the um, lesser known breeds of sheep, like the Icelandic, the blue faced lesters, there's less of a genetic pool available, so it's harder to get good rams. So, with artificial insemination, 
we can bring genetics, semen in from foreign countries and spread those breeds out in the United States then. So when we look at uh, ways to artificially inseminate sheep, there's basically three big topics or categories of them. Laparoscopic would be the first one. That's a surgical procedure, just uh, basically like if you have a, a gallbladder that needs to be removed, they'll go in laparoscopically, look inside on the camera, pull that out, and, and you're done. They do that same process in, in sheep and in goats and, and white-tailed deer. However, you know, it, it is a surgical procedure, so it, it, it takes some extra care and guidance on that end, and it's also an expensive and labor-intensive procedure. Uh, some of the white-tailed deer, you're talking at $200 just to, to inseminate uh, a white-tailed deer by the laparoscopic method, so it kind of becomes cost, cost prohibitive in, in some, some areas. Transcervical, um, those that are involved with um, cattle reproduction, um, AI and cows, will pass a rod through the cervix and then the, the semen is deposited in the, in the uterine body. However, the, the way God made the sheep cervix, it's, it's very turgid and very um, not straight. It, it's got a lot of crooks and crannies in it. So that makes it very difficult to pass a rod through it to, to be able to inseminate success, successfully. A lot of times when you try it, what happens is you, you hit you hit a side of the cervix, you cause damage, and then that decreases fertility rates. So that's why transcervical is, is not too um, much of a go in, in sheep. And the third area is, is what we call intravaginally. And so semen is just deposited within the, within the vagina of, of the U. <clears throat> However, with that is we have de decreased conception rates because the, the sperm cells have to swim through the cervix, into the uterine body, up the uterine horns to the uh, place of fertilization. So by the time it has to go all that way, a lot of the sperm cells are dead or are dying before they get to, to do their thing then. And one advantage with this though is it's a very simplistic procedure. So, kind of a lot what Don already talked about, why, why are we doing this grant? And it's simply to investigate if there's an economical and practical way to, for farmers to artificially inseminate their own sheep. And so the, the group that's involved with this is, is Don and his wife Ann, Jeff and Kathy Bielik, Ginger Davidson, Dr. Dale Durr, and myself. And here's a picture of just the motley crew up there. And so uh, what we did, we, we decided to look at the intravaginal artificial insemination technique. We looked at doing transcervical, and we went back and forth on it, and, and we thought just for the ease of everything, this would be, would be a good start to see if it would actually be an, an accomplishable thing. So the three flocks that we, that we used were um, Don and Ian's, Jeff and Kathy's, and, and also Dr. Durer's. So we, we had a mixed group of, of uh, breeds. We had Katahdin's, Polypay, and Blueface Lester's, and we used 20 U's per farm. And for the actual uh, artificial insemination, the semen was collected either by uh, electro ejaculation or, or use of an artificial um, vagina. And whenever you're AI and sheep, it's kind of tricky. You have to you have to synchronize them, meaning you have to have them all come into heat at, at one given time. It's not like cows where you know you can call up select sires and they can come the next day or, or that evening, whenever you saw them in heat and breed them. We have to do a group of them at one time in order to make it to make it um, practical. So we'll talk more about the synchronization here in a little bit then. So um, most people have heard of uh, a breeding soundness exam on, on rams. And, and what that basically is doing is looking at the over, overall health of the ram. And you'll want to do this prior to the breeding season, you know, ideally a month to two months before the, before the breeding season. And the reason for doing this is 
we want to make sure that our ramps that we're going to be using two to a, a month to two months down the road are actually fertile so they can get the they can get the um, job done so we want to look at the body condition score of the rams we don't want a skinny ram we don't want a fat ram skinny they're going to have a hard time breeding and, and fat rams is the same way uh, feet and legs we, we want good good confirmation on the on the rams we don't want any foot rot we don't want any uh, abscesses you know so on and so forth we want to check their teeth and make sure that their their mouth is sound one so they can eat properly and two if they have a broken mouth we're going to potentially be passing those bad genetics on on to future generations we want to measure testicle size one of my professors at, at vet school always says size size is important for this. The bigger the bigger the better for, for testicle size. If small testicles aren't going to have the ability to, to produce the amount of semen that, that it takes to breed a, a, a high number of ewes. And how we collected uh, the semen for the uh, uh, breeding soundness exam was either by the artificial vagina or electro ejaculation. Just something um, to, to kind of remember, the ram is half a flock and garbage in equals garbage out. So if we throw a ram in that's not fertile, we're gonna get, we're gonna get garbage at the, at the end. So just something to, something to remember there. So this is just a picture at, when we were up at Kathy's measure, measure scrotal circumference there and uh, getting an idea on that, one of the steps of the breeding soundness exam. And then that picture there is um, an example of an uh, artificial vagina. And then there we are uh, collecting one of the one of the rams. There uh, we have a, a, a jump you or a teaser you, and then uh, then the ram there. Um, you got to be pretty quick to get them to get it caught there. And then there's just a picture of Kathy looking at the uh, at the semen under the microscope, looking for. Um, the morphology of the sperm cells, we want to make sure that the sperm cells are, are properly made so that they can swim to the, do the job that they're supposed to do. And then also we look at concentration to see if the, if the semen is concentrated. There might be cells there, but if it's really dilute semen, that's less number of ewes that, that can be bred then. So, so for this study, um, we collected the rams, and then we did a microscopic evaluation of, of the semen to look for a lot of things that we just talked about, you know, the morphology. And we also did the, looked at the concentration. The concentration was, was determined by a, by a specific method. And then um, once we knew the concentration, we could um, know how many ewes we could breed from that given ejaculate from, from the rams then. And we also did, um, we, we used an extender to, to dilute the semen out so we could breed more ewes uh, in, in a, an appropriate manner then. So for the intravaginal insemination, kind of the steps that are involved with it are restraining the ewes. That's kind of what Don's expertise was in for the, for the trial. We, we had somebody re restraining them, holding them, we had to clean the vulvar region. That way we, we just used like a dilute iodine um, scrub and we wanted to make sure that everything was clean in that area because we don't want dirt to go, to go up in and potentially contaminate the semen and um, decrease our conception rates then. So the extended semen was then drawn up into a pipette. What we used were, I unfortunately don't have any, didn't have any at home to, to bring along to show but it's basically just um, it's basically like a hollow pencil is, is what it reminded you of with an opening on the, on the one end, or actually on both ends, and then the, the other end fit onto a, a, a tip of a syringe, and then we pulled the semen up into that pipette then. And then the final step was to, to just deposit it intravaginally. So that here, what we're doing on, in this picture is Dale's, uh, the one bending over with the with the beige hat on, he's cleaning the, the vulvar region there, and getting ready to inseminate. 
and then this is a picture of, of a loaded pipette. You can see right here the, the syringe, and then this here, it's not showing up real good, but that would be the pipette filled, filled with the semen then. And then there's Jeff. You can, you can see that he's um, inseminating the U right, right there. So it's a, it a pretty simple procedure. Um, we did about 20 in two hours, two, three hours. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, as time went on and we got more experience with it, it, it went a lot quicker and we kind of learned some, some tricks of the trade and, and that sort of thing. So practice, practice makes perfect. So in order to, to synchronize the use like we talked about before, to have them come in at, at, the, same, at the same time, we, we have a product called a cedar. Has anybody heard of what a cedar is? Okay. This in my right hand is, is what's called a cedar. And it's, it's loaded with, with um, a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is normally made in the, in the body of, of, a, of a U. And what this does when, we, when it's inserted into the, into the vagina, it basically mimics her being pregnant. So it stops her from coming into a heat. And this is the tool that we use and it fits into this gun. And then it's inserted into the vagina. And then it releases over time a, a slow, constant amount of progesterone. The cedars are, are left in for 14 days. And on day 12, we give a shot of, of a, another hormone called prostaglandin. And prostaglandin is a hormone that's normally made in the, in the body of the U. And when she's coming on the end of her cycle, prostaglandins will actually always normally be produced. And that signifies, tells the body to start to get ready to come into heat then. So we gave, we gave a shot of that at day 12. And then on, on day 14, when the cedars were pulled, we, we have to give another shot of a, of a product called PG600. And what PG600 does is it, it stimulates the uh, ovaries to produce follicles. And then what that does also is to cause ovulation at a set time. And when, uh, when, the, when a you ovulates, it releases the egg down into the fallopian tube. And then the sperm meet up with the, with the uh, released egg and then causes fertilization. Then. So, 48 to 52 hours after the cedars have been removed in, in the injection of PG600 is when you want to, to breed the ewes. And that's, that's the um, procedure that we followed and it's kind of a common procedure in the um, AI industry and sheep. So you might be wondering, you know, do we just waste our time and waste our money and everything? And, doing all this big project and everything. And to be honest with you, I was kind of skeptical. It's been, AI and sheep has been tried and tried and just every so many years, there's a big new fling of it and then it kind of fails off, falls off just because it's not um, an easy thing to do. So I was really hesitant that, that if it would actually work. And so uh, after the first time we did it at Kathy's, Kathy and Jeff's farm, we ultrasounded them about 40 days after, after insemination, and uh, roughly 50% of them were, were pregnant. So I was expecting maybe, to be honest with you, maybe two out of 20 would be, would be pregnant. I thought we were wasting. I never said anything to anybody, but I thought we were wasting our, <laughs> wasting our efforts. So I was very, very excited and very pleased to, to see that we got 50%. In, in the remaining two farms, both at, at Don's and Dale's, it was at least 50%, and, and at Don's it was probably closer to um, 70%. So there, there is a, a lot of future in, in this area. 
So just as a conclusion, I know this is the last one on, on the, of the day and people want to probably get home. Um, but you know, we, we got roughly 50% uh, of the use pregnant from this trial. And you know, it's the first time that this has been done really. So there's, there's room to make improvements. So that number shouldn't go any lower. If anything, it should go, should be going up higher in years, years to come. So, you know, I see this as, as providing a, a, a new tool for the sheep industry, for those that are into breeding sheep. It's a practical approach. One thing that, you know, in the future, additional work will need to be done and um, I consider the semen handling part to be a major area that will need to be addressed. And uh, another area is will, will we be able to collect the ram in Georgia, ship the semen chill to Ohio, and impregnate use and actually get live lambs in. So that's that's kind of the, the um, obstacle, I think, for the future. This trial, and if it's not over, we're going to be going for another year then. This trial showed that we can get used pregnant, but long term, will we be able to, to get those genetics from one area to the, ne to the next and, and actually make some, some genetic progress? So that's um, kind of where I see a lot of work need, needed to be done on this in the, in the future. Any questions for anybody? Sure. What's the approximate cost per view of the progesterone implant and the possible anesthesia? Yeah, you're talking uh, the cedars themselves cost about five to six dollars, and then the PG six hundred and, and the prostate gland and shot, you're, you're talking probably about another six dollars. So, so I'd say roughly twelve to fifteen, and, and that might even include some of the other. Um, Miscellaneous expenses, some of the like the pipe pads and, and just the miscellaneous supplies. So. Any other questions? Sure. I'm not familiar with the uh, electro shop. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, what? What that is? There's a there's a, a rod. It, it it's, fits into the rectum of the of the sheep, and there's electric pulses that are released, and then that causes the, the ram to extend his penis and it causes ejaculation. And how uh, humane I mean, uh, does that mean this come from that? Or? <laughs> yes, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there is probably some, some discomfort to you. I mean, you have to, um, you have to deal with care and, and, and everything, but um, yeah, there's, so is, it, is it easier to squeeze a teaser with you? Or some some place some places and some places not. Depending on depending on, on a lot of the a, a lot of the circumstances. Sure. In this so. case, uh, the farms we were collecting we were losing the rams around the same farm. All right. So we could take a ewe that was already brought into heat, put her in the chute, and the ram would come right in right there and was able to you know naturally go right in and breathe. All right. Now, um, so if you're doing the electric jacket, um, well, it's the same thing on that farm. When we were doing it in the chute, we we're tipping them on their side, and there is some straining that goes along with the ram on that because of collection. As far as the amount of semen collected, we got a lot more semen collected out of the uh, artificial vagina by far. I mean, one farm we didn't get hardly anything, and then did an artificial vagina and had not out of one jacket to breed 20 ewes at that one spot. So that's, uh, you know, there was a night difference, I thought. Sure. There was another night difference of, in some cases, um, the cleanliness of the vagina area. And, and especially in my farm, as a wool farm, if I'd gone to and cleaned out or, or shaved the vagina area, the back of that area, I think it would have been a lot easier. Um, and, and with the hair sheep with Kathy, there was no problem there. It was just a matter of cleaning. So there were some things we had that we were learning. Um, the artificial, uh, the collection of the ram, if we had cleaned around the bellies on them a little bit better, or hadn't even done that in some cases, uh, that would have made the collection a lot easier too and a lot cleaner. Okay. 
So there were some things that, you know, we definitely did some things wrong, but from one farm to the next farm, we were learning. Okay. There's, there's several That's, things you can do. Oh, yes. Okay. Secret collection is hard. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, hard, it. it's a hard thing. It's, not all, not all rams will, will jump just into you, and, and then not all of them will ejaculate using that. They like to ejaculate it too. So it's uh, it's kind of a gray area. And if there was an easy way, it would then make, make it a lot easier. See, back in the 70s when I moved to Ohio, we were just starting with stallions, all right? And I was with an equine program with OSU. Okay, it took 20 years for all the breeding farmers in the country to get this down to somewhat of a reasonable situation where we could ship the human overnight to California, all right, and chill, all right? So now we're trying to figure out how to get this done here also, um, you know, so that we can get something out of Arkansas or Florida, if we can get them on how to FedEx it overnight, but they did that. And stallion semen, you get 60, 50, 60 cc's of semen at ejaculate for the ramp, we're getting one milliliter, and that was a whole new game to me. Sure. You know, how do you divide that up among, I mean, with a stallion, you can do 10, 15 mares. This way, you're doing one milliliter, trying to get 20 done. And that was a whole new, that was a whole new ballgame for me to try to figure out. And then you had to add the extender to it. And we used three different types of extender on each farm. With the extenders, it was, and we had three different trials going. Well, my wife was involved with the extenders and the microscope work and understanding the amount of steam and evaluation and the mobility of this. Okay, so the extenders, they, they're also feeding the semen once it's collected. And they're, at, they're at giving a, uh, uh, a protein, is that what I want to say, a protein to this or a feeding? They're feeding the semen along with extending this and, and preserving it. So, you have to keep the semen alive. So we did a 24, 48, and 72 hour deal. After the first two farms, after 24 hours, we had no live semen underneath the microscope after it was chilled, all right? So we were using equine, which is a normal semen extender. That's all we knew. And by the time I got done, I was talking to select sires. And select sires said, we need to call this guy in Iowa. I call the guy in Iowa. He says to me, I'm just a U.S. distributor. All the extender for select sires and that comes out of France. All right? And he says, I can sell you about a, a bottle for $16 an extender. All right? So we called the equine facility where we've been getting all the extender from. He said, we just got some from France and we just got some from Brazil. So we used the French, the Brazil, and the U.S. extender at the end. And at the end, uh, after 72 hours, we had live semen and the French and Brazilian, and the U.S. extender was down to about zero. And we were able to extend that live semen underneath the microscope, chill, up to 72 hours, with better than 50% on French and Brazilian extender. And to me, that's that's one of the things we need to go with in the future. The next step is talking to different organizations that are interested in this, and different breed associations that are getting frozen semen in. They're getting thrown from up from um, the Icelandic people from, uh, from Iceland. Okay, that, they're only getting 50% off of the frozen semen. My next step is, is there a possibility of learning how to freeze semen? And that's another project. Okay. We're learning our way through it. We're learning our way through it. Okay, very cool. So, any other questions? Sure. Um, when you answer the fact that you have to be careful about the angle that you insert in, like you yeah. would have. That's a, that's a good point. Usually go up about about a 45 degree angle for, for just you know a little bit, mm -hmm. and then it, then it tapers off, and then so you want to raise that raise that pipe that off, and then then go straight in, and, okay. and then what happens then is you, you hit like uh, you'll come in contact with the cervix then, and then that's pretty much where you where you uh, uh, deposit the semen. Very very good question. Um, just the way the the vaginal floor is. It goes up at an angle and then it, then it tapers, it tapers off. Exactly. Right. Just, just the opposite of that. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay. Thank you much. Yeah.